commitment to Scripture, a commitment to community. You know, last week we looked at community, and this week we want to explore the reality of community. What is community as an act of worship? This might surprise you because, you know, I think we've cheapened worship uh, to just being about singing some songs. There's this kind of theology that has crept into the consumer church that's, that has reduced worship just to purely a, an act of singing. But when I look through Scripture, when I look through the life and the, and, and the depth and the breadth of Scripture, I realize worship is just so much more. And part of that so much more is my being able to see Christ in my brothers and sisters, to, to see one another. Remember in Matthew 18, Jesus says, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything and ask for it, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. And where two or three are gathered, there I am with them. Now tell me, if you were living with that real truth that Jesus is sitting, there's three people at this table, Jesus is sitting here. What would your attitude be at that table? What would your attitude be at that table? What is your attitude at that table, at that table, at that table? Do you see? When we start living in that, that mindset that when I am with my brothers and sisters, Christ is present, does that not change the way I relate? And doesn't Henry Beecher's words start finding traction? I did not know how to worship until I knew how to love. You see, community is the moment of worship in the presence of Jesus. Contrast that to the worldview of today, with what we've been taught and what the church has, kept, has kind of caught the disease of the self-made man, the, the individual. My faith is something private and I don't talk about it. And you don't talk about religion. You see, there, I think, first of all, there's a vital spiritual union. As followers of Christ, we are bound up and immersed in the person of Jesus. He is present with us. That's what we've just said. And that presence transcends my individuality. It's not about me, myself, and I. It's about us. And I'm about to go off another, on another sermon tangent. In, it never happens, does it, Graham? <laughs> In Africa, the understanding, I am who I am, not by what I've done or anything like that, but how I'm seen in my community. I am who I am by my community. That's what I grew up with in the sense of when we were living in Zuland. Your, your whole identity is not tied up in what you've achieved but it's in the Ubuntu of the community. You see, there's, a, there's something of truth in that. When we interact with our brothers and sisters in the faith, we are not just interacting with fellow human beings. We're encountering Jesus. If we believe that every person in this room is created in the image of God, we're encountering Jesus every time we encounter one another. And therefore, that is is an act of worship. And so that actually gives traction to the words of Jesus in Matthew 25. Remember when he said, what you do to even the least of my brothers, you do unto me. You know, that's the, 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 the parable of the sheep and the goats, where he, he separates. And the sheep, he says, you visited me in prison, you, you cared for me, you clothed me, etc. And they say, when? when you did it to the least of my brethren. You goats, 
You didn't. But, but when did we not feed you? When you didn't do it to the least of my brethren. And so <clears throat> Jesus, he ties his identity to us in that. That each of us carry that identity. You see, community is living sacrifices. Romans 12, 1 tells us, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. And <clears throat> in that, community is part of sacrifice. It inclu includes our interactions. When we gather in community, we lay down our preferences, our comforts, our time, and sacrifice. Every act of kindness, every act of forgiveness, every act of encouragement within the community is an act of offering ourselves as living sacrifices, which is our true spiritual worship. It's bearing one another's burdens. Galatians 6.2 instructs us to bear one another's burdens. And th this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And I love this one. In who remembers, I'm going to show my age here, the good, illustrated Good News Bible. Okay? And there was a wonderful illustration on this. Bearing one another's burdens. The person in fr front is having their burden carried by the person behind, but their burden has been carried by others. You see, so often we, we reduce church to bearing one another's burdens, but it's one person carrying everybody. But each of us need to be bearing others' burdens. You see, as an act of worship, it's not me, myself, and I. It's us. Bear one another's burdens. When we listen to a hurting friend, when we pray for someone in need, when we celebrate together, these are acts of worship. Our compassion and empathy become fragrant offerings to the throne room of God. This reflects the Trinity, actually. The Trinity, now I'm going to use a long Greek word, perichorosis, probably pronounced that totally incorrectly, but basically what it means is the dance of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dancing in this, this unity. The Trinity reflects community of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and reveals the beauty of unity. When we love one another, we mirror that divine dance, as it were. And the unity in community reflects the very nature of God. Just think of, uh, just on the top of my head, 1 John 4, verse 7 and 8. It tells us that God is love. Not that God loves us, but that He is the very essence of love. So when we love one another, we're reflecting the very ens essence of God. Sorry, that te text wasn't up there because um, it just came to me now. And then the last area is the Lord's Supper. When Jesus gave the command on the Lord's Supper, he did it in community. And that's why I kind of, as I look at the scriptures of the Lord's Supper, just, just go with me on this one. Every one of them, when it's spoken about in Scripture, is around a meal. When Jesus instituted it, where was it? It was a meal. When Paul speaks about it in 1 Corinthians, and we're going to read it extensively now, note where the context is. Uh, it's a communal act. So let's, let's read this. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part. I, um, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one of you goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? 
Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I have received from the Lord what I have also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, eats, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of Christ. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For everyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now that phrase, discerning the body, has led churches into major theological stances, you know. But actually, if you understand what Paul is saying there, you know, it's, it's this thing of when you read Scripture, you read it in its context. You know, taking a passage out of, out of context is a pretext. In other words, you read what you want to read. But what he is saying there, if you're not discerning the body, what body is he talking about there? The church, because he's just gone through a a diatribe saying, you have brought condemnation on the church by not caring for the poor, that you get drunk and the poor starve. And he puts it in that context. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body drinks judgment. And you see, that's why for me, yes, sometimes we do have those, the, the kind of more traditional communion services. But for me, more often than not, I want to see it in the context of a meal together. Because every time in Scripture, it's in that context. And so if we want to really be religious, we actually have to do it in the context of a meal. <laughs> and yes, it's so much harder to do because it, it, it's not easy. But actually, if you, if you read this passage very care- carefully, you see that actually it's the first bring in shares that are there. You know, some of you bring your food and eat it and, uh, separate from the others. And the picture there is that we bring our food and share it with each other. We bring and share our meal. Um, and so maybe that's an easier way to do it. And so, if we think of it, if we look at this, we see again and again that worship is an act of community. Well, let me say that the other way around. Being in community is an act of worship. Being in community is an act of worship. So just even being here together, as we've unpacked those scriptures, is an act of worship. Where two or three are gathered, I'm in their midst. He is here, present with us. You see, community is not an optional add-on to our faith. It is an integral part of our worship. We need to learn to embrace our brothers and sisters, even the prickly ones, you know. Have you ever come across those that you kind of go, we need to love one another. For in community we encounter Christ. Our lives become a symphony of worship before the King. And may our gatherings and conversations and our shared moments 
be a fragrance of worship. Remember Beecher's statement, I never knew how to worship until I knew how to love. Just reflect on that statement for a minute. Let's just be quiet. And you see, this is why life groups are so, so important. That we learn to love one another. And so we want to encourage you to get into a life group as soon as possible. Right. We're going to move on now and do a a lecture. Can I ask you guys to hand out to everybody a sheet? Thank you. We're going to move everybody around on tables and a little bit later so that there's uh, groups on tables. Uh, We can't have two people by themselves, they'll eat more pancakes than the rest of us. (laughs) Now remember, a lecture is reflecting on a scriptural passage and seeing what God is saying to us as individuals in that passage. Okay, and I'll lead you through it. And the text for you, you at home is Acts 2, 42 to 47. Acts 2, 42 to 47. As we read this passage slowly, let your awareness rest on the words that have been spoken. Listen for the still, small voice of God. What is He bringing to your attention in this passage? What's coming to life in this passage for you? So let me read it. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled in awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was, had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together in glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's just be quiet for a moment. I'm going to reread it a little bit slower. While I'm doing that, meditate on the words and the phrases that catch your attention. Think of them. Start thinking of any memories or emotions that it stirs up within you. Because often that's the Spirit speaking to your heart.
they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to go to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. As I prepare to read it again, ask God why this word has caught your attention. What is he saying to you? Talk with him about what you're hearing and feeling and journal your prayer. I'll read it again and then we're going to give it a long time to listen. And respond. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily, those who were being saved.
okay. Just rest in God's presence. Just seeing God touching people and just being present with you. Now, if you're doing this lecture at home, you would spend time just resting and listening and just being silent and meditating. And then all through the day, let the word, just that the phrase that's come up for you, just mull in your spirit. And you chew the word and you repeat it and you speak it, that it becomes part of you. But in this context of community, we're going to do it slightly differently. Because we're going to go and grab pancakes in a moment. And then come back together after eating our pancakes. We're going to just go through some questions and just share at our tables. And after that, you will, the, each table will report back, as it were. And so... Um, yeah, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to ask Rachel to come up and give us our instructions on what to do, and then uh, we eat and celebrate, and the children will join us for that time, and then we will uh, go into discussion.